Go ahead. We're all set, Eric. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Thanks for double duty. <laughs> sorry about that, folks. This is uh, from 1 Corinthians. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher? For of this age, has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since the wisdom of, the, of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs, Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those whom God has called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influ influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of this world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, that is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Well, believe it or not, I'm still sending out the wired word. I don't know if anybody reads it, but uh, this mm -hmm. week's version. <laughs> Talks about the inner core of Earth seems to be slowing its spin. 3,000 miles below the surface of the Earth, a scorching hot ball of solid iron floats inside a liquid inner core. And this superheated ball is about 95% as this hot as the surface of the sun and about 70% smaller in diameter than the moon. That's down in the very <coughs> center of the core of our Earth. Now about 30 years ago, scientists found evidence that the, this inner core was spinning at its own pace, just a little faster than the rest of the planet. But a recent study suggests that around 2009, uh, the core slowed its rotation and spent some time in sync with the surface of the Earth. But now the core appears to be lagging behind the surface of the Earth. Now most geologists believe that the energy released by the inner core causes the liquid in the outer core to move, and this generates electrical currents that give birth to the magnetic field that surrounds the Earth, Humans and other organisms can be grateful for this magnetic field, which shields us from the most damaging forms of cosmic radiation. So they're not quite sure what's going to happen. But you know, I'm reading this and I'm going, oh my gosh. You know, it, the physics behind all this, and, 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 and this is just our Earth. You know, the, 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 the miraculous dynamics of what goes on to just keep this earth as a place where, where we can be alive and stay alive as human beings and other creatures. I mean, it's just, it just blows me away, you know, the creation of what lies behind, the knowledge of putting all this together, the ability for just this one little planet. What do they call it? The, the third rock from the sun? You know? mm -hmm. And we're just one planet of, of the rest of these planets and this one little solar system with this medium star who, and, and we're just part of a one galaxy of millions and billions of other galaxies throughout the universe and I'm saying to myself, oh my gosh, our God created all this. It just kind of blows me away. That's our God, the omnipotent, the omnipresent, the omniscient, eternal God that we say Lord. We call him our Heavenly Father. 
And the Apostle Paul in Philippians 2, if you go to that chapter, he describes how this omnipotent God, this omni God, omnipresent, omniscient, eternal, uh, omnipotent God decides to take upon himself human form. If you read Philippians 2, this is basically what he says. That this God, this creator God, decides to put upon himself human form, which is practically unheard of. I mean, gods don't become human. But this God became human, he says, and dwelt among us as a fellow human being. But then Paul goes one step further and he says, but this particular human being that was both God and human decided not to use his godly powers to benefit himself. Paul says he literally emptied himself of any desire to use this fantastic universal omni power and to benefit himself. He was going to use it, it was going to be for the benefit of others. But then Paul goes one step further, he says, in Philippians 2, he says, this human God uh, decided to enslave himself to humanity. This human God became a foot washer, am I right? He washed the feet of people. He humbled himself to literally washing people's feet. Now you have to remember that back in those days, uh, every household had a foot washing slave because people would come off the streets, they would take their sandals off, and you know, their feet would be filthy, dirty, and they would sit uh, reclining. They wouldn't actually sit in chairs, but they would recline so that their feet would stick out a little bit and the foot washing slave, which was like the lowest of the lowest slaves, would come and wash your feet before you left. That was just courtesy. But if you were the foot washing slave, you were the lowest of the lowest. I mean, that's where the beginner slaves came or, or the punished slaves came. <laughs> but here we have this human God, Paul says in Philippians 2, who actually chose to humble himself and become a foot washer of humanity. Oh! But he goes one step further. He says, no, that was not enough. This human God decided to, to literally die as a thief on a cross. I mean, you have to remember, if you were dying on the cross, you were considered to be a criminal. You know, somebody that was uh, being punished for something. You know, so Paul goes in Philippians 2 and describes how this human God just totally emptied himself and humbled himself all the way to being willing to die on the cross for us. And then he goes on to say in this Corinthians passage that it was all for the purpose of showing us a totally different way of living our lives. A totally different way of living our lives. You have to remember that the Apostle Paul traveled thousands of miles in you know, what was considered to be the civilized world of that time. He was actually privy to be <clears throat> in Athens, and he went to the Athens think tank. You know, Athens had a think tank <laughs> among the Greeks. You know, the Greeks were great philosophers, but he actually went to the Athens think tank and, and met some of these great philo philosophical people, these great knowledgeable people, and... And uh, he, yet he said to them, but, you know, you have this one space over here for an unknown God, you know, who allowed himself to be crucified, and they didn't want anything to hear about that. You know, that was just practically unheard of, because they were highfalutin thinkers who were trying to uh, impact the rest of the world with their highfalutin thinking, and hoping that their highfalutin thinking and knowledge would help better the world. And Paul says, well, yeah, you know, humanity has tried to better itself on its own uh, credibility for centuries. And, uh, 
it hasn't worked very well, <laughs> Paul says. And it's funny because um, I've been, I, this past week I was teaching some third graders, and uh, well, not third, but fourth graders, and they were actually talking about uh, the Roman civilization. And, and it's funny because they, they, when I'm reading this, these books, the, the Roman civilization was, was talking about the barbarians up north and the Germanic tribes and the barbarians up forth in the land of Gaul, which is modern day France. And I'm saying to myself, you know, Roman civilization, the Romans were about as barbaric as you could get. I mean, they introduced the world to the cross. I mean, the cross was the symbol of Rome, you know, the brutality of Rome. Yeah, so much for being, you know, non-barbaric and civilized. I mean, in other words, we as human beings, as much as we say that we're civilized, there's still some of that barbaric nature in us, no matter what. Isn't that right? And you know, all you got to do is watch the news to see barbaric things happening in our own society. And, and so... Um, what Paul was trying to do in this Corinthians text is basically say, saying that God provided us an alternative for existing in this world that goes way beyond the wisdom of humanity and gives us a whole new way of living to move us from this barbaric fetal position to hopefully being civil, but this calls us to go way out here into the realm of being compassionate and forgiving and merciful and kind relying totally on the Lord, you know, love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. I mean, this is the way that the cross teaches us. The world can't do that. The world can't do that. Well, it tries. The world has a very hard time getting us from this. You know, this is a fetal position. This is a brutal position in many ways. We're, we're called to move to here. You know, Johnny, share your, share your marbles, you know. But we're called, and Paul says no, in 1 Corinthians, we're called as believers to go way out of here and to live like this. In my uh, devotions for this week, it says these words. This is on January 30th, last Monday. It says, the world is in such a desperately fallen condition that there is only one remedy for it, making everything new. So do not be discouraged when your efforts to improve matters are unsuccessful. All things, including your efforts, are tainted by the fall. Although I want you to endeavor to do your best in dependence on me, your world needs much more than a tune-up or an overhaul. It needs to be, to be made completely new. And that was God's attempt 2,000 years ago to start the process of making things radically new through the cross. You know, that's why this human God humbled himself all the way to being crucified as a common criminal. But, you know, we as humanity continue still to try to say, well, we don't need the cross. We can do it on our own. There's a lot of movements in our country today that are called progressive, that are attempts to, to say we don't need this symbol in our lives because we can do it on our own. You know, we can do it on our own. We have the knowledge, we have the wisdom. And it's funny, but it's out there. I mean, it's, it's out there. And, and uh, uh, my wife and I, we went to see the movie Otto. I don't know if you saw Otto. Great movie. Tom Hanks, I mean, he blows me away. Now, no matter what movie he's in, I mean, he does a fantastic job. And Otto is about, you know, an elderly man, well, maybe middle-aged, because I'm getting older, <laughs> uh, who just recently lost his wife, and he's very bitter, very like this. Isn't that right? Yeah, yeah. A few glimpses of this occasionally. And the movie, as the movie progresses, Otto, you know, moves from this, protective and, you know, punchy, to being a little bit more like this, and occasionally glimpses of this, you know, occasionally. And I, when I got home, I said to myself, but something was missing. I said, you know, because in the movie, Otto is influenced by multiculturalism, multiracialism, which is nothing wrong with that, multi, uh, uh, um, uh, 
genderism, uh, you know, multi-informationalism, multi-justiceism. I mean, all these societal things uh, were working on Otto to, to finally get him to move a little bit from this to this to, to occasion this. And I'm saying to myself, well, yeah, yeah, that might work on occasion, but how many stubborn old men do you get that are going to be influenced by all these things and move from this to this? <laughs> it doesn't happen that often. Maybe it does in the movies, but no, no, because in reality, there's really only one thing that can move a stubborn man who's like this to this, and that's the cross of Jesus Christ. And historically, that's happened millions of times. And sometimes we men need it more than the women. You know, somebody once asked me, why did Jesus come as a man? Well, we need it more than the women. I'll be honest with you, because we're stubborn, you know, and, and boy, you know, think about that. So that was what was missing from the movie, you know. <laughs> Where's the cross? Because that's the only power that I know that can take us all the way out here so that we live like this on a regular basis. And, you know, it's not an easy pill to swallow. I'm, I'll be honest with you. Paul's, in 1 Corinthians there, he's not saying this is, a, you know, peaches and cream. It, it, this is learning to live a whole different way. I mean, you can live like this your whole life without hardly any problem. When your arms get out here to be civil, you know, my mother used to say being civil is the beginning of Christianity. Yeah, this is the beginning. You can live like this. But man, if try standing like this for any period of time. You need help from the Lord because this is a very difficult position to live. About 20 years ago when I was at LCM, I uh, had a gentleman who came in and we talked and he was having marital problems and um, uh, his family wanted him to, to, to change and become more the, the person, um, you know, that I mean, this is a man that's you know has had uh, kids and grandkids and and they wanted him to to change and become more the person that they wanted him to be. I guess he had some anger issues and things of that sort. And apparently uh, he got on some medication. And I've seen this happen uh, where somebody gets on a medication and it changes them completely and they become more. You know, less like this and more like... I mean, I think God can work through medication sometimes to get people to move in certain direct directions, but... And apparently he, he, he got on this medication that did help him move from this to, to this, but he didn't like it. He didn't think he needed it. So he stopped taking his medication, which, from the rest of the family's perspective, did change his demeanor quite a lot for the time that he was on it. So, I mean, he came into my office and he's struggling with all this. He doesn't like to take this medication. He doesn't think it works. And I, I basically said to him, you know, you've got a choice right now of what you want to do with your life. <laughs> because uh, your family is asking you to, to take this pill. And if you want to be a stiff pencil and not take it, then decide not to take it and suffer the consequences. But if you want to become a little bit more flexible and understandable, you know, I call it being a rubber band man. You know, I've talked about it before. It's more stretchable, adaptable. I mean, Jesus was not a stiff pencil like the Pharisees. He was more adaptable and flexible. Isn't that cool? I mean, that's what made him so unique. I said, you know, if you want to become more of what they want you to be, you're going to have to swallow that pill. I mean, that's what it comes down to. Just take the pill. You know you think it may not work, just take the pill. And so that was his mark of demarcation, you know, that struggle between staying like this or learning to go a little bit more and out this way. Well, unfortunately, he decided to not take the pill and things broke down in his marriage and his family and he had to suffer some of the consequences of that. But uh, that was 20 years ago. It's not an easy thing to do sometimes to move in that direction because it's against our basic human nature. 
and the way we think. It's illogical to live like this. Much more logical to live like this. Much more natural to live like this. Much more part of our human nature to live like this. But it can be done. It, it happens in people's lives. You know, it's happened in your lives. I mean, I know most of you, you know, in your own unique way, have the cross as part of your life. I mean, it's there. You're, you're, <laughs> none of us can live like this. Christ is the only one who lived like this for his, you know, for his life. But, you know, we, 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 we have glimpses of this in our lives, and that's a good thing. I mean, it's, it's better to have moments like this than <laughs> stay like this for the rest of your life, you know. But it's, it's a constant struggle. But it can be done. Um, Voice of the Martyrs, I mean, I've talked about this before. You've got people in countries living like this with guns at their heads. Well, not literally, but, you know, who are living with constant threats and for their lives and their families and their, their houses where they live, in the churches. And this just came across the line. This happened in Turkey. This was uh, American missionaries. Oh, I remember that one. Brunson? Well, no, this was Geski, but it happens all the time. And this is a family that felt the need to call, to go to be missionaries in, uh, in Turkey, which is basically a predominantly Muslim country. So um, when Susan Geski heard uh, the answer to that question, tell me the truth, dead or alive, that her husband, Tillman, had been murdered along with two Turkish Christians. She struggled to comprehend what had happened. The five murderers, all ages 19 through 20 year olds, were arrested at the scene of the crime, but we don't know what happened. As Turkish media rushed to report on the missionary massacre, all the reporters wanted to interview uh, Susan, the wife of this... Uh, Preacher. They came to her door the day after her husband was killed. And so she, she prayed, Lord, what should I say? And the Holy Spirit pointed her to the words of Christ on the cross. Forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. I mean, that's what she ended up saying. Can you believe that? The day after her, her husband died, she said, Forgive them, for they know not what they are doing, because those were the words that Christ spoke on the cross. Though the Turkish media often paint Christians as the enemy, with the help of people like Suzanne, who took the opportunity to share the gospel of forgiveness and the love of Jesus Christ, the living example of forgiveness was broadcast all over Turkey at that particular time. Isn't that amazing? That's just simply amazing. So through, uh, through the cross... You have to remember that the cross is a new lens. Uh, the, the, the cross is, a, is like a lens, uh, a sacrificial lens uh, embodied with Christ through which God uh, refocused the light of his salvation uh, uh, attempts into something brand new uh, that gives us an alternative to, uh, human, to human attempts to, to, to quote-unquote, better ourselves. This is uh, the way of the cross. The power of the cross brings peace, reconciles to God, redeems, saves sinners, crucifies the world to us, abolishes, you know, attempts to be righteous in our own way. That's abolishing the law and draws one to Christ. So uh, that's what the refocusing of what we consider to be the way of, of, of making this world a better way, a place to live. Um, than our own human efforts. But for us guys, you know, sometimes that's a problem, I must admit, because of our egotistical nature. Nothing personal, but I'm a guy. Uh, but it can be done. You can still be, you know, somewhat macho and still be, you know, like this. You know? I, mean, I can't think of anybody more macho than Jesus. <laughs> you know? giving himself, you know, how many men would be willing to do that? And the brutality of what he had to endure in those last few hours of pain and agony. Talk about, uh, you know, a machismo, <laughs> knowing full well what he was... Uh, well, you remember, Jesus knew exactly the amount of pain he was going to endure. 
as God, he knew exactly the amount of pain and agony he was going to endure before it actually happened. He knew how piercing those nails were going to be, and yet he went forward with it. How many of us, as macho guys, would be willing to do that, knowing full well the extent of the pain and the agony we would be bearing, <laughs> we'd be exit stage right, you know, boom, be out of there, isn't that right? But you can still be, you know, because I did a funeral on Friday, this past Friday, for a gentleman. I, I didn't really know him, but uh, I did a funeral up in Gurney. And um, this guy was 62 years old. He was born in the projects of Newark, New Jersey. I mean, when I lived in Philadelphia, people would say, stay away from New York. I mean, it's kind of a... <laughs> but it, it was, uh, but he, he, but through his strength and determination, he got himself out of those projects. Uh, statistically, only one out of four ever get out of the projects alive, pretty much, for the average. He was African American. Um, <clears throat> and through his strength and determination, he went into the uh, uh, army, got, uh, became a paramedic, got an honorable discharge, uh, came out, got his college degree, and then worked for a pharmaceutical company uh, where he rose to corporate level. And uh, Unfortunately, he died of prostate cancer, but um, just, you know, I do a lot of funerals, and uh, a lot of weddings, a lot of funerals, but this one just kind of blew me away. Because in addition to my getting up there and kind of leading the service, seven other people got up from all different perspectives of, of his life in-laws, sisters, uh, a high school buddy, I mean, somebody who worked with him. And they all said, you know, that he was, <laughs> he was kind of a, a studly guy. I mean, he was, <laughs> but yet, every one of them talked about his compassion, his kindness, his mercy, his love. So even though the guy was, you know, and you saw pictures of him, I mean, he was, he was still living like this to the best of his ability. And so, he had a, a positive, constructive, beneficial impact on the world that he lived in and people's lives. And that's, that was a great thing. So, amen to that. Let us pray. Lord, we just thank you again for the cross and what it means in our lives and help us to learn what it means to bear the cross. Uh, even though it might be foolishness to the world, it's uh, your wisdom and it's a, kind of a beautiful way to live in a kind of a sacrificial manner, but uh, that's what we're called to do. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen.